<laughs> Welcome to the Health and Human Services Finance Committee. Uh, we will call the meeting officially to order. We do have a quorum. Uh, Representative Heinzman moves the minutes from January 19th. Any additions, corrections, or changes? Seeing none, all those in favor of adoption of the minutes, please say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. The minutes are adopted. Uh, today we have updates from the Minnesota Department uh, of Human Services. And uh, first up, we have uh, an update uh, from Nathan <coughs> Rocco, the Assistant Commissioner. Welcome to the committee, Commissioner. Please introduce yourself and proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, for the record, my name is Nathan Rocco. I'm the Assistant Commissioner for the Department of Human Services, overseeing the Health Care Administration. Uh, Mr. Chair, and to members of the community uh, uh, committee, my, uh, I'm here to provide updates on three key areas, uh, estate recovery, uh, per the request of the committee. Uh, it was on estate recovery, uh, Minnesota Care Premium Reconciliation, and then the transfer of uh, Medicaid enrollees uh, that is scheduled to take place here uh, in late spring. Um, so to that, uh, Mr. Chair, on the estate recovery piece, just as a point of background, and I'm assuming um, there, folks have a handout. The, did that get to, to the committee? Okay, thank you. Um, so I'll just sort of cover some of the highlights. I won't read it all. Um, but just for background again, in 2016, there were changes made to the estate recovery process. Um, for those um, who were involved in this, this had to do with um, the, uh, some of the, the expansion population coming on to the MA program and having concerns over the potential uh, estate recovery process that we had uh, at the time. Um, and then through the 2016 session, we had made changes uh, to how the, the estate recovery process works uh, and then subsequently worked with CMS uh, to get that approved. You can see here in the notes um, that there was a slight modification. Um, uh, in that uh, CMS did not like the specific effective date that we had in place and um, we were asked to remove that. So again, just as point of background, um, this is for folks who were 55 and older, again, generally uh, impacted the expansion population or at least that certainly was the focus of the concern, um, although it would have impacted anyone on the program. Um, the legislation that was passed was just to focus the estate recovery um, in, in just some key areas um, rather than having it apply to sort of general medical services. Uh, it now applies just uh, 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 specifically to nursing facility services, home and community based services, alternative care services, and then related hospital and prescription drug costs uh, that go along with those. Um, as I mentioned, we did um, we then work with CMS. We contacted them in September of 2016. Um, they did ask that we make that, that change. Um, as a result uh, of the effective date change, meaning that it needs to apply to the population universally, um, there will be um, some cost impact to that, and that will be reflected in the February forecast. Uh, Mr. Chair, do you want me just to continue to go on or and cover all topics or? Uh, yes, Commissioner, if you don't mind, if uh, members have questions, we might uh, derail you temporarily and uh, ask you to come back. We'll watch the clock and see if that works. Uh, and so just uh, keep rolling. Okay, Thanks. thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, then moving on to the Minnesota Care Premium Reconciliation process. Um, for those not as familiar with this, um, Minnesota Care has a premium that is um, billed to some of the Minnesota Care enrollees. Uh, as a result of some of the challenges that we had on the Minnesota Eligibility Technology System, otherwise known as METS, um, we had some, some challenges in producing accurate bills. As a result, there were uh, both um, delays and potential in inaccuracies with the, with the premiums, uh, and that then has led to what we refer to as the premium reconciliation process. Uh, the good news is, is that premiums are out the door, they're accurate uh, and timely. Uh, what that leaves us with then is a period of time where uh, clients' um, bill, bills may or may not have been uh, accurate, uh, and the reconciliation process is, is, uh, is our way uh, 
of reconciling in total either what the client may owe the state or in some cases what the state may owe the client. Um, so the process really involves us going through um, the prior years when, when the MET system came up, 2014, 15, and 16, and really going back to the, to the initial point in time at which the premiums were inaccurate and then reconciling from that point going forward. You'll note here that um, that there hasn't been an actual reconciliation, a, a complete reconciliation, uh, and that is because we need to reconcile all years for all the clients before we actually proceed uh, with any attempt to um, to recover the the. Um, the, uh, uh, these, these outdated premiums. Um, and in essence, that is so that we don't get into a situation where one year we might be asking a client for, for money uh, and then reconciling a future year and ending up having to, let's say, have to pay them back. We don't want to be in a situation where we're sort of going year by year and you know having really different messages coming out of the agency. So our goal would be to do an entire reconciliation so that we, so that we can communicate to the client the full aggregate impact uh, of the billing um, through the years in which uh, the system was uh, was unable to to provide uh, accurate and timely premiums so we're we're expecting to complete that process yet this year in 2017 2014 has been reconciled I would say that that definitely took us longer than we expected but we did overcome some significant IT hurdles and anticipate that 15 and 16 now that the process has been developed that that 15 and 16 um, uh, reconciliation would, would occur uh, much more quickly, which will allow us to then issue sort of the total reconciliation yet here in 2017. Uh, Mr. Chair, there, I don't know if this was on the agenda, but we did uh, just want to add in. Folks had asked us about some of the renewal activities, so provided an update um, for, uh, for the committee um, and just sort of highlighting uh, that we feel that we had a pretty successful renewal process this year. We had a lot of communications going to clients. You can see that we had a significant ramp up period, um, much different experience both from an internal DHS perspective and I think from a client perspective than what we've seen in prior renewals. And so we're, we're very happy uh, at this point with the outcome of our, uh, of our 2017 renewals. And finally, uh, Mr. Chair and to the members of the committee, uh, you asked for a managed care enrollee transition update. Um, again, this is uh, a process that we are engaged in in order to accommodate um, one of the uh, managed care organizations <laughs> from withdrawing from some of the uh, Medicaid and Minnesota care uh, contracts. Um, the, at a technical level, that, that actually occurs on May 1st, even though the withdrawal notice occurred uh, prior to January 1st. Um, we are engaged in that process right now in that we are um, identifying the solution um, from an MCO perspective on how to um, ensure that we have a complete network for our clients. And then of course we will engage with the, with the clients in the very near future, providing them with an opportunity um, much in the same way as we did with our transition uh, at the end of 2015, um, providing uh, clients with whatever information they might need to make an informed choice about their managed care and network options uh, effective May 1st, uh, 2017. So with that, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, um, that, that concludes my update. All right, so questions for Commissioner Barak? <coughs> All right. Seeing none, thank you. Thank you. And next up, we have uh, Claire Wilson, Assistant Commissioner, Community Support. Welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. My name is Claire Wilson. I'm the Assistant Commissioner in the Community Supports Administration. And I am here to give you two updates today on items that fall under my administration's purview. <coughs> One, the Certified Community Behavioral Health Clinics. You have this handout in your packets. Um, and then an update on our SUD reform efforts. So I'll just start with a brief update on the Certified Community Behavioral Health Clinics, or the CCBHCs because we don't have enough acronyms. Um, 
So as you all know, there are many complex challenges in our mental health system, including the fact that services are not evenly available across the state, and the fact that the system can be incredibly complex to navigate. Anybody who has tried to get treatment for someone or someone entered into treatment for either a mental health or an addiction challenge knows that there are multiple doors and multiple avenues to trying to access good coordinated care and treatment. So recognizing that, um, we have identified one potential solution that has come down from uh, the federal government in which Minnesota is currently implementing, and that is these certified community behavioral health clinics. So these are an innovative model of delivery service that acts sort of as a one-stop shop. So one door where you can walk through, access primary care coordination, access screening services, access your mental health outpatient services, and they are all centered in a community mental health center clinic. And what's important about that is these clinics have been and are the center for providing this care for this population for a long time. These are really the clinics that have innovated and learned from how to provide provide mental health treatment and treating this population. So in 2014, Congress enacted the Excellence in Mental Health Act. And this was uh, really the largest <coughs> investment in years in community mental health. Um, it passed with strong bipartisan support. And then the state legislature um, went ahead and mandated that the department apply for one of the planning grants that the Health and Human Services Administration was administering to states. Minnesota applied for one of the planning grants and then spent two years in the process of preparing to certify six clinics to serve as uh, a certified behavioral health clinic. Um, in the process of that two-year planning grant period, we did prepare an application to participate in a two-year demonstration project. And Minnesota was one of the eight states recently selected to participate in the two-year demonstration project. Um, Minnesota's six CCBH pilot sites will begin providing services by July of this year. And you have a map on the back of your handout there. You'll see that the centers that will be serving as clinics will be Northern Pines Mental Health Center, which is right there in the central part of the state, Northwestern Mental Health Center up in Crookston, Wilder Children and Family Services, People Incorporated in Ramsey County in the metro, and then Zumbro, Zumbro Valley Mental Health Center in the southwestern part of the state. And then you'll see on the other side, on the front side of your handout, all the different services that those clinics will be providing. So during the demonstration period, they will receive an enhanced match on the Medicaid population. So rather than the typical 50-50 state federal share, it will be a 35 state share and a 65% federal share. That funding continues through December 31st of 2018. And you know we are currently analyzing options to allow this to continue past the demonstration period. Uh, this will be a chance for us to really look at how this works and see if this coordinated way of providing care has a positive impact on the communities we're serving. And if so, we'll be able to have a continued conversation with you about how to make these sustainable across the state. The next item, should I just keep moving? The next item then is our SUD reform. So you have two handouts related to this in your packet and I'll reference them as we move forward. So as many of you know, last year the legislature directed DHS to develop a comprehensive proposal for reform of the Minnesota Substance Use Disorder Treatment System, uh, and specifically to look at developing a robust continuum of care. It also directed us to look at options for mitigating the impact of the IMD rule. And so this limits the state's ability to capture federal funding in treatment facilities that meet the characteristics of an institute for mental disease. There's a complex formula for determining this, but it essentially says that if a facility has over 16 beds, it is designated as an IMD and meets other certain characteristics of an institution. It's designated as an IMD and is no longer able to capture federal funding for services that are provided. So. Um, I am excited to share with you today that in the governor's uh, budget, there is a proposal for comprehensive substance use disorder reform. And so I will talk a little bit about that that is responsive to the request of the legislature. Um, but before I do that, I know there's a lot of interest in the IMD issue, and so I'm going to do a brief update on that. So a quick, just a quick review. 
um, in Minnesota, state and counties and Medicaid. Excuse pay me, Ms. Wilson. Oh, yes. Um, just uh, we've got a couple new members on sure. the committee. Could you just please just kind of back up maybe even a half block before then and just describe what that is, how it gets paid for, uh, who, received the, who receives the services and where that money goes? Sure. So in Minnesota, the way that we pay for treatment for public for publicly funded treatment is a fund called the Consolidated Chemical Treatment Dependency Fund or the CCDTF. So this pays for treatment services for people who are underinsured, uninsured, or otherwise need public pay to help access treatment. The fund is funded through state dollars, county dollars, and federal, and federal matches on certain services. Um, the federal government, like I said, through Medicaid, matches some of those funds in the CCDTF. So that's how treatment services are publicly funded. Now, in the Institutes for Mental Disease or any facility that's been designated as an IMD, the, the federal match for those services cannot be captured because CMS does not allow us to, uh, to capture those funds in IMDs. So if a, if a chemical treatment program has been designated an IMD, then the state and the counties must match that share, pay for the, pay for the treatment in full. So, Determining IMD status can be really complex. You know, federal law defines an IMD as programs that have more than 16 beds or other characteristics that meet um, institutional. So in 2015, DHS did an, a review of existing programs and Rule 31 programs. We worked with counties, providers, stakeholders, and CMS in order to make sure that we were in alignment with the federal rules. And as a result, more than 30 programs that were formerly considered not to be IMDs are now considered to be INDs, IMDs. So the fund continues to pay for the treatment of those individuals, but the fund does not receive Medicaid reimbursement for services that, um, it, sir, that are received within those facilities. So the expected outcome then, because people are placed into treatment based through, when they access services through the fund, they do have to do an assessment and then they're placed in their level of treatment. They're placed by tribes, counties, MCOs, depending on who's doing the assessment. Um, there was, of course, some fear that there would be a decrease in those who were placed into those services because of the loss of the funding. However, a recent analysis, which is included in your packets, does show that um, access to those services stayed the same. So there was the same number of, you know, there was predominantly the same number of people <coughs> accessing those services. Um, so those services were, um, the services had, it has had a physical impact on the state and counties, but it's not impacted the access to treatment. However, we still have to think about how to make the system sustainable in an environment where we're going to have to pay for these services in full at the <coughs> county level. So the legislature directed DHS to look at the 1115 waiver, which among other things would allow for us to capture federal funding in IMDs. So um, the tricky piece of this, though, is that the waiver has to also include comprehensive reform of the system to support that cap, that um, that exclusion for the IMD. So essentially the waiver is a tool to help us develop a comprehensive system of reform. So um, we have been working with stakeholders and providers to make sure that Minnesota is prepared to meet those requirements so that we can uh, successfully apply for the waiver. And to this end, uh, the governor has proposed in his budget package a series of reforms that will really position us to apply for that 1115 waiver. So I'll just briefly say that that includes adding withdrawal management to the benefit set, adding care coordination services to the benefit set, allowing direct reimbursement for um, licensed drug and alcohol counselors um, that they can bill for outside of Rule 31 settings, making peer support reimbursable, and finally, and maybe most importantly, allowing direct access to treatment. So removing the requirement for Rule 25 so that treatment can be accessed more quickly. So that leads us then back to the IMD question. There are, you know, we are moving forward with the application of the 1115 waiver so that these reform efforts 
and getting the waiver for the IMDs are all at interacting together to create a comprehensive system. There are still challenges in applying for the waiver. Waivers have to be budget neutral. And waivers, of course, are at the discretion of CMS. They can grant them and they can, you know, remove them at, at their will. So, you know, we just have to be aware that for this to be sustainable, we have to think about how to reform the system in order to support how we can fund the system. And I would say that uh, the proposal in the governor's budget also gives DHS the ability to control the growth of IMDs while we're doing this without closing the door to continued development where need is determined. So while we remain challenged to secure federal funding for these services, I think that I can say as we've worked with stakeholders and providers and payers across the state, that we are really committed to developing these reforms so that we can create a system that can be sustained. And while this is, you know, a moment of significant challenge for the system as we lose this federal funding, it's also a profound moment of opportunity. And so we're looking forward to really continuing the conversation about how we build out a sustainable system of care that really works for Minnesotans to achieve and sustain recovery. All right, uh, questions, members? I think members probably have uh, not, if you haven't uh, recently, those of you who have on, been on the committee have heard from several facilities probably in your districts uh, struggling around with uh, how to move forward with this change in classification <coughs> and we'll continue to uh, up date uh, the committee and on any plans that we might have uh, for moving forward. Thank you so much for, uh, for coming to the committee today. We do appreciate it. All right. Next we have an update from Minnesota Management and Budget. Uh, Paul Moore. Welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself for the record and proceed with your testimony. You need to get hooked up there, take your time. Thank you. All right. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Paul Moore, Executive Budget Officer from Minnesota Management and Budget. Tremendous AV skills. <laughs> you are. There was an engineer in the room earlier today who helped okay. me through it. Um, well, thank you, Mr. Chair and committee members for having me today. I am here to provide uh, an update to a letter that Minnesota Management and Budget sent to the legislature back in December about a deficit in the state government special revenue fund, as well as provide an overview and background as to how the fund operates and, and really how we got to this place. Uh, so to begin online on slide two, uh, when statute or session law refers to the state government special revenue fund, they are really referencing four separate accounts in the state accounting system. Um, there's a 911 emergency fund, uh, which is funded through uh, fees on our phone bills, um, and that supports the statewide um, 911 emergency telecommunications uh, through the Department of Public Safety. Uh, there is the construction code fund, which is a surcharge and on all construction permits in the state. And that funds uh, enforcement of the state building code at the Department of Labor and Industry. And finally, and what, what is really most relevant to this committee, we have the 1200 fund, 90% of, roughly 90% of spending in that fund is by the Department of Health, but there is some activity by other agencies, including Department of Human Services. And then there is a 1201 fund, which is used exclusively by the state's health licensing boards, uh, 15 of them. The only one who doesn't operate out of here is the Emergency Medical <coughs> Services Regulatory Board, because we fund them through the general fund. Uh, so. As you can tell, uh, the common theme among all of these funds is that they are supported by fee revenue on regula regulated entities. Um, so on slide three, I've provided a table that helps kind of discern the jurisdictional, jurisdictional lines uh, among the H HHS 
agencies and boards. But like I had mentioned, um, these agencies and boards license, regulate, and inspect business, public entities, as well as health-related occupations because the legislature has determined this is necessary to protect public health and safety. The Department of Health regulates hospitals, nursing homes, restaurants, pools, hotels, uh, a handful of health occupations, and then uh, the, well, the state's wells and public drinking water uh, suppliers. Department of Human Services uh, regulates child care and home and community-based service providers. And then in the 1201 fund, uh, this is the state's 15 health licensing boards and they regulate dozens of various occupations as well as educational programs. Um, what is unique about the state government special revenue fund, the 1200 and 1201 fund, is that the agencies and boards I had previously mentioned, when they receive fee revenue from their regulated entities, that revenue is not dedicated back to that agency to spend on their regulatory activities. Instead, when these agencies and boards collect fees, they fall to the bottom line of the 1200 or 1201 fund, and then the legislature um, direct appropriates money to these agencies and boards in our biennial budgets dictating their annual spending limits. And so we've removed the direct relationship in this structure between fee revenue and uh, spending limits. This then has created a situation where the 1200 fund, like I said, uh, where the departments of health and to a lesser extent human services operate out of, is over appropriated and therefore the fund is facing a deficit um, starting in this fiscal year. Uh, I will say the 1201 fund, which is not shown in the, uh, in the slideshow, has a projected uh, surplus of $23 million this fiscal year and that will continue, it's projected to continue to grow over time. The 1200 fund, however, uh, is projected to end the year at a $2.9 million deficit. So the story of FY, the fiscal year six, 2016, is really the fund began or ended where it started. It had roughly $2.2 million uh, spending in the fund, more or less matched fee revenue brought in, and it ended the year with a $4.3 million balance. However, we're projecting in F, uh, fiscal year 2017 that if the agencies operating out of the 1200 fund were to fully uh, expend their, their resources, what is uh, um, legally appropriated to them, they would end the year with a $2.9 million deficit. Um, that deficit is continued to grow, is, or is projected to continue to grow into the next biennium and, and beyond uh, on line six, we show what uh, the projected deficit will be at the end of fiscal year 2019, the end of the next biennium, as well as the end of the tails 2021. So the, pro the projected deficit, if these agencies were to spend uh, the full amounts appropriated to them by the legislature, um, that the fund would end with a $11.6 million deficit by the end of 2021. Therefore, when uh, agencies had given us their revenue estimates as part of the November forecast, uh, when MNB had determined that there would be a projected deficit starting this fiscal year, we sent a letter to uh, the legislature as well as the commissioners operating out of the 1200 fund that there is this projected deficit and MNB is instructed by statute to remedy the problem. So uh, at this point in time, nothing to report to the legislature what that might be. Uh, MNB continues to work with agencies to determine um, where where expenditure reductions can be made, um, and when MNB and uh, and various commissioners have determined what these will be, we will uh, ensure that this is communicated to the legislature. And of course, legislative uh, input is invited. So please reach out to myself, the commissioner, or or agencies impacted as as we continue to to work to, to resolve this issue if you have um, various suggestions or concerns. So with that, I hope this was informative and um, I'm happy to take questions.
Thank you, Mr. Moore. Representative Fisher. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, back on, I believe it was slide five, where you're first showing the numbers uh, for the deficit for the uh, that we're first coming up to here. Sure. I noticed on uh, the MDH expenditures from fiscal year 2016 to 17, there's quite a large jump there. Sure. Can you explain what drove that large jump? Mr. Moore. Uh, Mr. Chair and Representative, um, agencies are uh, under six, uh, chapter 16A, state agencies are allowed to retain um, their operating dollars from the first biennium into the next. And so the Department of Health did not fully expend uh, all the appropriations available to them. So we balance that forward into fiscal year 2017. And for the sake of completing our financial statement, MMB projects that an agency is going to expend the full amount um, that they have the legal, legal authority to do. So the, the jump is reflective of that, um, the carry forward from fiscal year 2016 into 17. Representative Fisher. Okay, I, I'm, uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so if I'm understanding correctly, uh, the because they did not fully expend everything in 2016, it shifts it to 2017. If they would have fully expended everything in 2016, we would have actually seen the budget, start crop, the budget deficit crop up this year then? Mr. Moore. Mr. Chair and Representative, that is correct. Um, so that, that kind of dry, drives my next question, kind of trying to drill down back further, um, is the reason we've had a surplus is because we've been putting, the agency keeps on putting off expenditures, or did something tilt somewhere along the line that started uh, driving the, the difference in expenditures? Mr. Moore. Mr. Chair and Representative, uh, in my tenure as, as executive budget officer, this has kind of been a persistent, pervasive issue with the fund. And the Department of Health particularly has done a great job of managing their expenditures uh, at levels at which they know they're going to bring in uh, fee revenue. Uh, however, the uh, uh, Minnesota management and budget determined that because this has been kind of sustained over time now, it was important to inform the legislature that this continues to happen and that it's going to, it's projected to continue to happen through fiscal year 2021. All right, other questions? Seeing no other questions, thank you, Mr. Moore. Thank you. And next up, uh, we have an update from the Minnesota Department of Health. Uh, Chris Ayersman, Director of Infectious Disease. Welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you. Um, my name is Chris Ayersman, and I'm the Director for the Infectious Disease Epidemiology Prevention and Control Division at the Minnesota Department of Health, or MDH. And I was asked to provide a brief overview today of a tuberculosis or TB situation in St. Louis Park that garnered media attention, as well as provide you with information on MDH's public notification for infectious diseases. So let me begin by explaining a few points about TB. Nationally, there were more than 80,000 cases of TB per year back in 1953, but today there are fewer than 10,000. In Minnesota, we've gone from several hundred cases per year a few decades ago to about 150 cases per year today. TB is spread via the respiratory route when someone with TB disease um, in their lungs coughs, sneezes, speaks, or sings, they can spread TB disease and TB can be latent or active. In the case of latent TB, the bacteria can live in the body without making you sick. So people with latent TB are infected, but they are not sick and they cannot spread disease. When latent TB is diagnosed, the person is prescribed antibiotic treatment to clear the infection and to prevent them from developing active TB disease later on. People with active TB disease are sick from TB and they have symptoms. These symptoms may include a bad cough lasting three to four weeks or longer and a pain in the chest. If the disease is in the lungs, the infected person can spread TB to others. People found to have active TB are prescribed drugs that can treat TB disease. And of persons infected with TB, only five to 10% will ever go on to develop active disease. 
It's natural to be concerned about infectious diseases, but it's important to note that TB is not nearly as infectious as many other infectious diseases, such as measles or influenza. People with active TB disease are most likely to spread it to people they spend a lot of time with in close contact every day. TB is not new, and over the decades, public health officials have developed a lot of knowledge on how to effectively limit its spread. In order to control the spread of TB, we follow standard national guidelines to identify close contacts of a person with TB. Contacts are then recommended to be tested and to receive treatment should they have evidence of TB infection. These guidelines have been in place since 1976 and along with antibiotics have contributed to the successful reduction in TB disease in the U.S. and Minnesota. Since 1992, the number of reported TB cases in the U.S. has dropped by 61%. So the question of when does the Department of Health notify the public? Um, the Minnesota Department of Health takes immediate public health action when we're notified of an infectious disease situation of concern. And to this end, we maintain a 24-7, 365-day on-call system for infectious disease consultation and response. MDH and our local public health partners follow established evidence-based practices for investigating infectious disease cases. And this includes rapid public no, excuse me, this includes rapid, rapid public notification when warranted, as demonstrated many times over the years, including the situation in which we had a loss of fever case in an air traveler in 2014, a measles case um, at a local university in 2015, and numerous investigations into foodborne illness every year. However, the decision for public notification requires the balancing the need for information in order to take appropriate action and the desire to avoid causing undue concern and fear. Not every infectious disease event warrants broad public notification. Tens of thousands of disease cases are reported to us each year. In fact, doing broad no public notification every time could result in information overload or crying wolf with the unintended consequence being apathy when action is needed. Ideally, public notification includes clear information on risks and appropriate actions that should be taken. And in most cases, we are able to contact exposed individuals directly, and public notification is not necessary. There's no standard template right time for notification that would be applicable to all infectious diseases. However, there are a number of factors that we consider in making decisions about public notification. These include, first of all, the disease. Diseases have different modes of trans transmission, different levels of infectiousness, different incubation periods, and different treatment options. Because of this, our response to each disease is different. When we look at mode of transmission, uh, different diseases can be transmis can be, excuse me, diseases that can be transmitted via the respiratory route or through a contaminated food item generally result in a broader notification. But even when you have respiratory transmission, um, the type, whether it's droplet or airborne, can have different consequences for notification. Um, equally is the question of infectiousness. Different diseases have different levels of infectiousness, with measles being one of the most infectious. Measles transmission has been documented in persons who entered an exam room 45 minutes after a case of measles had left. TB has a low level of infectiousness and requires prolonged exposures in an indoor setting to transmit disease. The other, another factor we look at is the incubation period. In some situations, the time between exposure and development of disease is hours to days. And obviously this requires more rapid outreach and notification than a disease with an incubation period that can take weeks. We think about what kind of mitigation activities are there. Can, can we um, discard contaminated food or immediately isolate someone from others? We also look at treatment options. We consider whether or not treatment is available. For some diseases, there is no treatment available, and our only option is to intervene immediately to prevent disease development. So in the case of measles, there's a window of time in which we could provide vaccine or Ig to prevent disease. 
In other cases, there's nothing that you can do to try to prevent the disease, but if treatment's available, then we make sure that that can be offered. And then finally, um, the other consideration is the number of people at risk. In many cases, the number of people at risk of disease is limited, and direct contact can be made with each individual. In other cases, the full extent of the exposure is unknown, or the number of potentially exposed individuals is so large that the media must be used for notification, for example, an exposure to a contaminated food item. In each situation, we weigh all of these factors to determine the most appropriate type of communication. So returning to the St. Louis Park High School situation. <clears throat> First of all, keep in mind that public health, in this case Hennepin County, uh, begins working on a situation right away, regardless of whether or not the public is aware. Because tuberculosis is slow to develop, treatable, and does not spread from person to person nearly as easily as some other diseases like measles or influenza, Widespread notification of casual contacts in the earliest stages of an investigation is typically unwarranted. In fact, raising an alarm among people at very, at very low risk may be counterproductive and reduce responsiveness of future advisories or alerts. In the case of infectious pulmonary tuberculosis, the established response protocol involves quickly identifying the individual with illness, removing the infected person from settings where others could be exposed, and beginning treatment. It also includes identifying those who are likely to have prolonged close contact with the ill person and determining whether or not those contacts may have become infected. If one of the close contacts is found to be infected, then treatment recommendations are made. Hennepin County followed these standard practices in the recent TB situation at St. Louis Park High School. Hennepin County worked with the high school to identify persons who had been in contact with the TB case. They were then able to reach out to parents with information about the situation, their child's exposure status, and to provide them with information about testing opportunities that were to be provided free of charge at the school. This way, parents received all the information that they needed at one time. Earlier notification would not have improved the outcome and would not have given parents knowledge of whether or not their child had been exposed nor a plan of what to do next. The Department of Health takes infectious disease response very seriously and the decision of when and how to communicate is based on a variety of factors. And in the case of this situation in St. Louis Park, we feel that Hennepin County acted appropriately. Thank you. All right, thank you for that. Uh, presentation. Do we have questions? Uh, I just had um, one a little bit, um, and thank you for checking in with me a little bit earlier on this, uh, Ms. Harrisman. And w one of the things that I was kind of curious about uh, was legislatively, what do we mandate that <coughs> schools or other employers? Uh, report and do we do that in statute anywhere that you know of? Uh, Mr. Chairman, um, we the communicable disease reporting rule is what mandates reporting of disease to the Department of Health. So that would mean that a healthcare provider, a veterinarian, or a laboratory um, or a school would need to notify the Department of Health if they were aware of one of the diseases that's reportable. Um, that rule does not address whether or not um, you know parents should be notified or how a school needs to make notification about a case of infectious disease. It really addresses how diseases are reported to the Department of Health. And I'm sorry, was that a, um, is that a federal rule or a state rule, do you know? Uh, Mr. Chairman, that is a state rule. All right, and the do you know where in statute that is where we s spell that out uh, for and what the what those diseases and conditions are that are mandatorily reported? I do know, although I cannot tell you the actual the number? number of the okay. rule, but I can get it for you. Okay, all right. I was just interested um, in that, um, just primarily as a, a dad of three kids between going through um, daycare and then preschool and school uh, through the backpack and through email and all of this notification that we get. 
Uh, every time a kid gets the sniffles or strep throat or lice or lots of these things, it seems like we always get notified immediately. And if anything, I feel over communicated with about uh, all of the things that are cropping up in my kids' classrooms. And so I think like a lot of folks, uh, they felt like, hey, what's going on here? It took weeks and weeks and weeks before I found out that there was TB in my kids' school. Um, and uh, it seemed to, to many of the folks that that there was, um, that that created a, um, uh, some, uh, may perhaps reaction or overreaction that, hey, why aren't they telling us anything about this? So if you have to kind of steer between over-communicating to cause people to freak out a little bit too much or under-communicating and, uh, and, and not communicating enough information that would cause people to become very alarmed, uh, there's kind of a balancing act there that obviously the folks at the school uh, made a determination that number one, they were mandated to report to the Department of Health, but not mandated to report to the parents. Um, and from experiences in other states or in other situations, are there other examples where there was TB in schools where the parents <laughs> maybe were notified immediately that caused a reaction that was negative? Or how was that decision informed, if you know? Okay, um, Mr. Chairman, just if I could comment on the strep and the, the lice situation first, just to explain. Um, we do um, defer to schools and school nurses in terms of some of those situations in which they're aware of a disease like um, strep throat that's going through a classroom or through the school to make parents aware so that when they go to their providers, they can let them know about a potential exposure. Um, and the same thing is true with with lice and the idea is that they know who's been exposed usually those are in um, elementary classrooms where they know that the whole classroom has been exposed um, the challenge with um, tuberculosis and particularly in a high school setting is the fact that um, students are not all in a single classroom for the whole day and so part of the time that was taken between um, when the school was notified and when parents were notified was used to identify exactly who was exposed because not everyone um, was exposed in that setting. And so that's part of, that was part of the time frame in, um, in waiting to notify parents. The other element was to be able to offer parents kind of a one-stop shop for information. And that is that um, parents were told, um, the first time they heard about the TB in the school, they knew then your child was exposed or your child was not exposed. And if your child was exposed, here's what should happen. And in fact, we will offer free testing clinics at the school for your child if that's convenient for you or you can go to your health care provider. Um, and so from our perspective, the reason that we felt that it was worthwhile to have that time lag before parents got the information is because um, we certainly could have said something. You know, yes, there's a case of TB in the high school and someone in the high school, but we wouldn't have had any um, information for the parents to take action. Uh, in reaching out to their health care provider, they would have said, well, was your child exposed? Because that would give them the information that they need to be able to um, make a recommendation to the parent. And the parent wouldn't have had that information. So that is in part why there was a time lag was so that when parents got information from the school, it was everything they needed to take action. And because there's no um, downside in terms of uh, risk of transmission or ability to treat or anything like that from the science standpoint, that's why um, we feel that that was a, an appropriate um, you know, response. Now, there have been other situations in which um, you know, schools have just said, there's a case of TB, and they've notified right away. But then that, that causes some challenges in that not all the necessary information is available for the parent. Did that help to answer your question? Uh, yes, and, okay. and just off, uh, do, you, if, do you know how many cases of TB have been reported in schools in Minnesota, let's say in the last 10 years? Um, we've probably had uh, a dozen or more cases. Many of them never um, 
come to media detection. We work with the school, we work with the parents, and um, we have a successful outcome. But we do have, I mean, we right now um, in 2016, we're closing out our numbers and we had 168, not official official, but uh, close to 168 cases of tuberculosis last year. And that included work sites, long-term care, um, schools. So it's a, it's a wide variety of locations and generally, um, I would say they don't, they don't garner um, attention. Sure. Uh, and do you know, do other states that you know of do that differently or do you know of other states that might mandate that they do that differently? Um, uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm not familiar with any states that mandate reporting to parents. A lot of times what happens is um, you work with the school and the, the school superintendent. So for instance, we had a case of meningitis um, in a school um, in the last week and we worked with the school and identified the close contacts, um, made recommendations for them to receive antibiotic prophylaxis. It was just a handful of people and there was nothing else that needed to be done. The school chose to put out a notification. Um, we didn't we didn't recommend, we didn't feel that there was a public health need to do that, but they wanted to. And so in that case, we just offered them a template so that the information they provided would be accurate. So sometimes it really depends on the school, um, but I'm not familiar with any state that has a, a mandate that you must report something to parents or um, within a certain time frame. Thank you, Ms. Ayersman. Representative Heinzman. Two things. Uh, you had mentioned that it would take time to determine where that student had been and who could have been possibly exposed and that that was a determining factor in uh, how much time was taken to finally notify folks that this had happened. Um, so how much time did it take? And then finally, um, do individual school districts have discretion as to uh, how they might individually handle this, or is this something that's happening at a higher level? Mr. Heisman. Um, Mr. Chairman and Representative Heinzman, um, to, to kind of answer your second question first, um, school districts can do whatever they want in terms of notifying parents. They oftentimes um, will defer to public health and ask what what public health recommends, what's been done in other situations. But as I mentioned uh, with this recent case of meningitis, um, there was no need to notify parents uh, in terms of any sort of risk to students or any sort of action that needed to be taken. But the school district wanted to make a notification and did so. So that was, that was their decision. Um, we try to help them if they you know, do something like that. We try to provide them with accurate scientific information so that what they provide uh, is correct. But we certainly do not um, stop them from notifying parents. Uh, then to your first question about the time frame, um, the case was um, first noted as being what's called smear positive that, that has, or, um, that doesn't, that's not the culture result, that takes, that comes later, but smear positive would indicate that the person um, is, is at a state of infectiousness of concern, um, and that was identified on November 7th. The individual had already been removed um, from the school setting, or had removed themselves, likely, um, you know, because of their illness, on November 4th. Um, we didn't get confirmation, culture confirmation, until later in November. Um, and initially, the emphasis was looking at household contacts. When we look at TB, we look at um, concentric circles of contact. And so people that are living with the case have the greatest opportunity for prolonged exposure. So they are. Um, in, you know, evaluated first. Then when that was done, they reached out to the school and began working with them at the end of November and then the letters went out uh, in mid-January now. And keep in mind that there was the winter holidays and the Thanksgiving holiday in that time frame. But that, that is the, the time frame. So um, 
the, there was information about the individual and infectiousness. They worked with the individual's closest contacts, household, that type of thing, then worked with the school and then um, you know, create or organize the testing and um, send information to parents. Representative Heinzman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Not to belabor this, but the question was how much time? Oh, Mr. Chairman and Representative Heinzman, how much time is needed? Well, between the time that we knew that there was an issue, Mr. Chair, I'm sorry. Between the time we knew that there was an issue and the time people were notified. That would have been at the end of November is when the, the school was first, um, they were working with the school for the, at the first and it was not until mid-January that parents were notified. So that would be about six weeks. Representative Grunhagen. Oh, well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I know it's a touchy area having been on the school board, but you know, just about every time <laughs> Just about every time I had a question when I was on the school board about a particular <clears throat> procedure or whatever, they always referred me to the MSBA mop, uh, policy uh, booklet. Isn't there procedures and policies laid out in the MS, you know, Minnesota School Board Association's policy booklet on infectious diseases? I'm trying to think, because I know we've had questions on that in the past. <coughs> but, um, <coughs> You know, that policy book from MSBA that's all based on state statute and regulations. And to me, they touch on just about every aspect of a, uh, you know, what can happen to a student from curriculum to uh, health consequences and discipline and everything else. So wouldn't they have procedures listed in there that should be followed as far as infectious diseases? That's serious, man. Uh, Mr. Chairman and uh, Representative Grunhagen, that would that would be specific to the 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 school district and to the school setting. And so, um, the Department of Health operates sort of in the public health setting. So we provide uh, guidance to the schools. We provide information about the disease, um, but we don't we don't we don't have the authority to to regulate when and how they would notify parents. So we make, as I mentioned, we make recommendations and we say, you know what, with this case of meningitis, you know, there were five contacts, they've all been notified, they've all been, they've all received antibiotic treatment. There's no concern for the rest of the, um, the children in the school. We don't think you need to do this, but it, it always remains with the school, um, the ultimate determination. Oh, Mr. Representative Grunhagen. Oh, just a follow-up comment. The, yeah, I would just, you know, if anybody's concerned about that, I would check out the MSBA policy book that every school district has. And it used to be they were available right online, and uh, that, that's supposed to be the so-called rule book for uh, guiding the decisions that are made by a school, like I said, in almost every area. So I just suggest that. Well, thank you for that. Yep. Representative Considine. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, this is more just curiosity. Um, can you tell me when an effective treatment for tuberculosis was um, developed? Uh, Mr. Here. Chair and Representative Considine, um, in the 1940s with antibiotics, um, that's when we were able to actually treat TB. Representative Considine. Uh, thank you. Uh, Grandpa died in 33. And do you, do, worldwide, do you know what the death rates are and how the, how TB, I know that when, um, you know, from our grandparents' time, it was a very, very common thing for people to die from in Minnesota. Many, many people had TB wards and TB homes. And so for even, um, even uh, not just o older Minnesotans, but many Minnesotans have direct family connections to that. So there's understandable um, uh, worry uh, and, and great concern, particularly with children around this. Um, and in the United States, obviously, it's uh, treatable now and different, but worldwide, what does that look like? Do you know? Uh, Mr. Chairman, yes, TB is actually um, the most common infectious disease in the world in that, in that one third of the world's population are infected with TB. 
So that means a third of the world's population is infected. Now, they, that doesn't mean that they have symptoms or that they can transmit disease, but they are infected. And then only about 5 to 10 percent of those individuals will go on um, to develop active disease. And I'll, I'll just comment that, yes, my great-grandmother um, died from tuberculosis when she after she came over from Sweden, and I myself acquired uh, active tuberculosis uh, during a service study semester. I attended St. Olaf College, traveled to India and Nepal, and came home with active TB disease. So certainly it is a problem um, globally, and in the U.S. we've been very fortunate because we have a really strong uh, public health system and are able to respond to each case of disease that's identified. Thank you, Ms. Harrisman. Other questions? All right, seeing no other questions, uh, our next meeting will be tomorrow, and uh, we're going to be starting in on the governor's budget proposal for HHS. Uh, so the uh, three ring binders are going to be constructed very quickly. Uh, we should have uh, some weightlifting for tomorrow, so uh, look forward to the governor's budget for the next couple sessions. With that, we're adjourned.